Good day, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers of the Advanced Regulative Medicine Conference, Evolve 2021, for inviting me to be part of this very distinguished meeting in South Lake City. And I know a lot of you here are watching from different parts of the world. And let me just uh, greet you. Uh, great day today, in spite of our pandemic. So let me go through my lecture, which is entitled Ultrasound Guided Regenerative Interventions on Neuropathic Pain. And this is uh, an update. I also shared this uh, lecture before, uh, but I just updated the, some of the information that is uh, present right now. So all of you will be able to follow through. So for my first slide, I have no disclosures. And then I would like to begin my talk with this uh, beautiful uh, Bible text found in Isaiah 40, 30, and 31. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I find this to be a very inspiring uh, message for me personally because of the fact that even as we are experiencing different uh, levels of challenges right now, we are still alive and we can still share, and we can still help our patients. And so let me just uh, begin by saying and defining what is uh, neuropathic pain. So what is uh, neuropathic pain? It is uh, from the International Association of the Study of Pain. It is a pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. So it's not just any pain that a patient feels, but it is very specific because uh, this is a pain that can be felt which has its roots or its cause from any lesion in any part of the somatosensory system. So if we have that, then we are dealing with neuropathic pain. Now, if you don't have any lesion of the somatosensory system, then that's not considered as a neuropathic pain. So just to make it clear to all of you. So uh, this kind of pain has an incidence of about 6.9% to 10% of the population. So it's pretty small but very significant. Uh, this is uh, from the latest study by Wang. And this is also representing 20 to 25% of all types of chronic pain. So we, we are looking at a lot of chronic pains. So 20 to 25% of that is due to uh, neuropathic pain, but less than 50% of the current analgesics only provide 50% of pain relief. So you can see here that by this, statistics alone, we will know that this is a very challenging problem and uh, there seems to be a very challenging therapeutic intervention that we can provide. And so we are looking at what we can do at present to address this problem. And the costs of this disease is about $1 trillion per year. So it's uh, pretty big. And so uh, it's quite expensive. And those affected are usually the patients who have poorer health, but greater disability, and has a reduced quality of relationships and productivity. So those are the typical uh, patients that are affected by neuropathic pain. So if you're looking at the lesions of the somatosensory system, as you can see here, now there are different levels. So it could be coming from the peripheral nerve itself, where it all begins, or it could be from the, uh, from the nerve itself going up to the spinal cord. There could be some lesion here as well, or it could be at the gray matter of the spinal cord that could also be affected. And all the way up to the ascending tract, there could be also lesions right there, or it could be at the thalamic area, or it could be at the sensory cortex where there is an involvement of that particular uh, a problem affecting that uh, that brain. So 
any part of this somatosensory system could give rise to neuropathic pain. So it's very important to, to determine which level of involvement uh, the patient is suffering from. And of course, uh, for our purpose, there are also specific areas just at the peripheral nerve because those are the ones that we can easily see. So for example, the peripheral nerve injuries together with brachial plexus injuries represents about 95% of the US population uh, affect, uh, suffering from this problem. And of course, 30% uh, of peripheral nerve injury consider their pain to be both intense and of course chronic as we have partly mentioned that in our epidemiology. And of course, 2% to 60% of post-surgical patients could have peripheral nerve trauma and thereby form neuroma in the process. So it's very important that we monitor. It's not just because of the surgery itself, but in the process of doing surgery, there will be an injury to the, to the patient. Now, this is a typical drawing of uh, Dr. Kajal when he was trying to explain what happens with the peripheral nerve injury and uh, how it looks like. And so he draw this is a very um, famous uh, drawing representing the, the, the nerve as it is being injured. So it's very interesting that uh, this is the concept that he started on when he describes a peripheral nerve injury. So for us right now, since we are using ultrasound, uh, we can also see a lot of uh, typical uh, nerve damage, which eventually for, will form neuroma. And so you can see here a terminal neuroma, so to speak, and it is described as, as a hypoechoic mass. So for instance, this is a terminal neuroma right here. And then it could be also found in between your nerves that could also give rise to neuroma. So actually any part of the nerve could, uh, could be injured and cause neuroma. But typically, this is the one that you see uh, when you are dealing with a terminal neuroma when a uh, nerve is injured. So very, very interesting when you see the older side and you can see that it's a bulbous shape and it's just really swollen. There could be some fluids right there. And uh, that is a very good description of what we see to be a nerve injury. And of course, when we do surgery, this is what we, what, what we also see when we, when we open this uh, particular site, okay? Now, uh, there is a very interesting uh, comparative study between what you see histologically and what you see by ultrasound. And so here, Burks and colleagues try to uh, dissect a swollen nerve, as you can see here by gross examination is a swollen nerve, and then by each level, A, B, C, then they try to look how this looks like by histological findings. And of course, by ultrasound, you can see here that this is uh, a little bit, uh, I mean, very, very conspicuous. Look at that, but it's a, a, a swollen uh, fascic fascicles. And while here, it's, it's almost like a diffuse, the, the nerve merges, and then you can have a very swollen uh, part of the nerve. And then of course, when you go to letter C, it, it goes back to the normal. So the more affected one is the one at letter B. And you can see here that what you see in, in histology is almost similar to what you see when you look at it from uh, ultrasound. So what are the basis, the molecular basis of neuropathic pain? So here, there are actually mediators of uh, inflammation that goes to the nerve initially. And there are carrier cells that brings this nerve injury up to the dorsal root ganglion at the dorsal of the spinal cord. And this is usually facilitated by a macrophage. And specifically, it is the M1 macrophage working with the T cells. So the moment it reaches the afferent nerve terminal at the spinal cord level, it releases three substances. We have the brain drug neurotropic factor, the glutamic, and of course the substance P right here. So these three substances are being released. And, and as a result of that, there are the receptors. For example, the glutamic has an MNDA receptor right here. And when it actually cleaves, it up it upregulates neuropathic symptoms. Same holds true with BDNF and same holds true with substance P right here. 
So you can see here how that nerve problem that started with a term terminal uh, axon maybe or at the peripheral nerve, uh, the sensory portion can actually reach the spinal cord by way of cells that carries it. And of course, with the help of the M1 MacFads, take note, this is M1 because the other one is M2. We will discuss this a little, late, a little later. Now, as a result also of that, when the NMDA is upregulated, it could stimulate cells such as your astrocytes and your microglia. You know that these are supporting cells of the central nervous system. And later on, I, I will have to discuss with you that this makes a very crucial role in the pathology of neuropathic pain. Now here, microglia, of course, is another cell, as I have mentioned, uh, between astrocytes and microglia, this one is the first one that goes to the site of an injury. But under normal circumstances, microglia is very important because it is the one that prunes the nerve in order to promote neuronal survival. And it, and it acts through your growth factors and the nerve factors. And so as you can see here, even as uh, there are different areas here, like the, like the, the cells that actually mediates this response. Microglia is right here, just mediating the responses in order to remove those cells that are not necessary. So it's, it's like a pruning, pruning when you do some uh, planting, of course. And here you can see that as the microglia comes in, now this will mediate other responses. So as I've mentioned, there is a microglia, which is present during the first few minutes of a nerve injury, then a little later within 24 hours, the astrocytes also will come in. What will this to do? It will release what you call the inflammatory cytokines. And we know that the inflammatory cytokines are the one that could relay this, these reactions, causing a lot of uh, pain, releasing substances and its receptors, which we have mentioned earlier, the substance glutamate and the BDNF to cause responses within your uh, terminal should I say, between the mediating between your axon of, and of course your dorsal horn. And when this happens, your central sensitization begins. And it only doesn't release that, but there are other substances which are released in the process. Now, in discussing the neuropathic pains, we have those what we call the biomarkers, which we which we note as very important because it is the one that mediates the responses. And as you can see here, the pro-inflammatory cytokines are the interleukin-1 beta, the TNF-alpha, and interleukin-6. And these are all coming from the activated microglia and astrocytes. And as we have mentioned earlier, during the first few hours, microglia is present. Of course, astrocytes is also available during the first 24 hours, but it persists up to your up to the 12th week. And the reason why that is important is because as this persists, it releases more pre-inflammatory cytokines. And so what used to be a normal pain sensation, as you can see here, under the, the influence of the microglia becomes a painful sensation, and we call it allodynia, because this chloride here that is found inside your dorsal horn is actually released and it goes out and causing depolarization here and excitation process. And of course, as I had mentioned earlier, the BADNF is also activated, the substance P, and, uh, and, and, and of course, those substances that are important, the glutamate, in the process of for forming your uh, neuropathic pain. Then of course, here, which is already in the, in the spinal cord level, the glial cells, which are the astrocytes and microglia, will further activate MEPK. And this is the one that promotes long-term potentiation and central pain sensitization. So it is usual to expect that Patients who feel neuropathic pain will also feel uh, will also uh, tell you about some other 
uh, pain in some parts of the body because of the process of central sensitization. So, um, interestingly, this MEPK, which also enhances the reaction, could be inhibited by the stem cells, as you can see, and we will further discuss that. And of course, it will release other substances here, the ERK1 over 2, GNK, P38, and ERK5. Of course, the most important one is ERK1 over 2 and P38. And these are the ones that is very important in the process of enhancing the response. Now remember, we mentioned earlier M1. The M1, the macrophages M1, are the one which helps in the initiation process of neuropathic pain. But there's another macrophage, which is called M2. And instead of uh, helping the M1, its reaction is opposite to the uh, action of M1. So where the M1 tries to enhance the pain, the M2 will decrease or reduce the pain. So this is the one that helps actually the stem cells in trying to uh, reduce the excitatory response of the nerve uh, especially when a stem cells are injected. And we will discuss that later on, of course. And here also, as you can see, the MACs uh, will act on uh, the, the nerves and it will inhibit actually the, the formation of more in one, but instead it will increase the, the formation of M2, which actually prevents neuroinflammation. And by the way, the M1 also has a role in Wallerian degeneration. And as we have mentioned earlier, uh, for the formation of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1, 6, and TNF-alpha. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, uh, there, is also, there are also activation of ion channels that are triggered by the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And these are the, the sodium channels. And it, it is named with different names, 1.8, 1.7, 1.6. And so these are also very important because once the, the interleukin-1b, which is part of the inflammatory cytokines are released, this is also increased. And at the same time, it produces more neuropathics. And so you can see the interplay of all the substances in the formation of neuropathic pain. And so it, it the, the, what, what once was uh, a very mild pain, becomes a chronic pain. And of course, uh, you can see here the, the role of, of sodium uh, 1.7 and 1.8 in the formation of chronic neuropathic pain. Of course, uh, there are other trips in the peripheral nerve injuries or transient receptor potential vanilloid. And of course, as you can see here, when there is a nerve injury, it releases the ion channels, which triggers an action potential. And of course, this will bind into the receptors in a lock and key fashion. And interestingly as well, this is enhanced by the TNF-alpha, especially the trip V1, while now sodium V18 is enhanced by interleukin-1-beta. So these two events could be enhanced both by MAPK. And guess what? Interestingly, trip V1 and trip A1 have the ability to be reduced by being blocked pharmacologically. Interestingly also, of course, that dextrose 5% water could, has the ability to block trick V1. So you can see here that there are simple solutions that could actually be used to, to, to block all the substances because these are the one that is prominent in terms of causing peripheral nerve injury or neuropathic pain, the trip V1 and trip A1. So how do we diagnose neuropathic pain? So of course it becomes non-specific in the beginning and can overlap with other diseases as we have enumerated here. And sometimes we always think CRPS is also part of neuropathic pain when actually in CRPS1, there is no involvement of somatosensory system. So it's not considered to be uh, neuropathic pain. Now, how many months will it take in order to diagnose uh, peripheral neuropathic pain. So from the date of onset, after the diagnosis, look at that, 23 months, almost a year. And you have not even done anything yet. You were just making a diagnosis. And another 
one year again. So that is where you try to refer him to a pain center. So don't be, don't be surprised if you are the ones treating neuropathic pain and all the patients coming to you have been suffering from pain for more than a year and less than two years. And probably you say to yourself, why are you referring it to me so late? Because in this study here, this is a new study, 2021, the amount of time it takes to be able to make a diagnosis for neuropathic pain takes about a year and the referral takes about another year. So that's a very long time. So how do we grade neuropathic pain? So it could be a possible neuropathic pain with his, his history of relevant neurologic lesion or disease. And of course, uh, we are not even sure whether it is already a neuropathic pain. Then probable neuropathic pain is associated with sensory signs uh, based on the anatomical distribution of the symptoms on clinical examination as well. And of course, the confirmed neuropathic pain using the diagnostic test that could explain the presence of pain in some parts of the body. So as you can see here, there's just a lot of conformatory tests that we can use, EMG, biopsy, MRI, all these things. Of course, we use MSK ultrasound. That's why we're focusing on the uh, modality of diagnosis in order to know the neuropathic pain syndrome. So if you look at the ultrasound, of course, just being acquainted with how the nerve looks like, it's usually hypoechoic or a, a trilaminar type of, uh, of uh, uh, anatomic representation in long axis view. And of course, it, it is like a honeycomb pattern on a short axis view, as you can see it here, as, as compared with your tendons, which is this one. Okay, so uh, just be mindful about the difference. I know a lot of you are doing ultrasound, so you know this very well. So what are the changes that we expect? So the earliest findings is just a decreased echogenicity of the connective tissue layers of the nerd trump, or it's a global hypoechogenicity. And then of course, there is a proximal hypoechoic swelling as we can, we can see it. One area is swollen. And then of course, towards the end, it becomes a little constricted. And then of course, when we do apply some pressure, then we can feel there's pain right there. The patient will probably just jump or scream or do, do things that will show that it's painful. There are abnormal flow signals by power Doppler which is also expected because of the inflammatory process that's going on. And of course, the distal innervated muscles innervated by such nerve will show an abnormal hyperechogenicity. So also try to look at that. There are changes in the muscle that can show that there is a nerve problem or there could be a muscle atrophy. So in other words, in, in, in some instances where you could hardly see the nerve, you can probably just look at the muscles and then see what nerve is innervating that muscle. And from there, you can already see which nerve is affected. And of course, uh, we have different conditions. We have neuropraxia. There is a nerve diffuse swelling pattern. So uh, it's a general diffusion of the nerve. So the size here, for example, is 0 0.15. That's an abnormal median nerve uh, uh, cross-sectional area. And then of course, uh, it could be an accident message. There is a notching right here. And then of course, there's a loss of fascicular pattern and there could be a fluid field areas in this uh, particular part of the nerve. And then of course, it could be a neurotmesis. There is an empty bed appearance because there's no nerve there. It's just the channel by which it, uh, it flows that remains. So it's an empty bed. And of course, if you don't want to do uh, ultrasound, you can do EMG. But if you combine the two, the sensitivity increases to about 98%. So it's very helpful if you do both because you can actually diagnose certain things that cannot be seen just by uh, ultrasound alone. And of course, a physical examination will also help you in diagnosing uh, nerve problems. So what are the therapeutic approaches to peripheral nerves? So it's very important to, again, find out the layers of the nerve. So we have the epineurium, which is the 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 layer outside of the nerve it covers the nerve fascicles and it's just really a tight junction with collagen fibers as you can see here and then you can see here the details of that the perineurium with the internal epineurium so this is the ultrasound uh, picture of that nerve so you can see that as well 
And then, of course, you can either uh, inject the nerve disease at the, at the uh, cervical spine. And then, of course, uh, you can do hydrodissection. For those of you doing hydrodissection, you separate the nerves from the tissue, the connective tissue that wraps around it using fluid. It could be a dextrose or whatever uh, solution you're using in order to uh, separate that. And of course, injection must always be not at the perineural level and no attempt should be made to puncture the nerve. So just be careful in, in using that. So you can use PRP, dextrose or saline solution as your, as your uh, uh, solution for hydrosexual. This is just an example of uh, a nerve hydrodissection. So as you can see here, I'm trying to hydrodissect the medial nerve. And then uh, when you push the fluid out, then the nerves kind of dissipates and you can see that the, the entrapment is, is gone. Okay. And then of course, uh, uh, we also have the regen regenerative interventions as one of the solution used for treating nerve problems. And uh, very interestingly, the missing chymal stem cells here, as mentioned earlier, will release good factor. And of course, will stop the conversion of M1 to M2 or that there are more M2. And the M2, as I mentioned earlier, is the one that prevents neuroinflammation. The M1 is the one that enhances neuroinflammation. So the MSC will try to increase the, the M2, which is the one that suppresses inflammation. And of course, exosome, uh, as part of our lecture today, will not deal on that, but we will talk about that. Uh, and uh, that's also a very interesting intervention that we can use. So here, it inhibits pain sensitization. So the M2 coming from the influence of the missing chymal stem cells will prevent the, the pain in, in our patients. And the same holds true with, uh, as I have mentioned earlier in the previous slide, the stem cells will inhibit the MAPK or mitogen activated protein kinase. And of course the stem cells here as well will also influence the M1, M2 conversion and we will the, they will actually uh, produce more M2, which is the one that is responsible for immunosuppression and of course, tissue repair. And this is from the study very recently, 2020 by Dr. Liu and his uh, group. And of course, what are the benefits of missing chymal stem cells? So as you can see here, it is very protective in a peripheral nerve injury, okay? So while the the, the nerve injury will release BDNF, glutamate, and of course, substance P. The missing chymal cells will release GDNF, NGF, and VEGF. So these are good factors that we consider to be very helpful in the nerve protection. And of course, if you're using human bone marrow stem cells, it could alleviate mechanical allodynia and thermal hyperalgesia. This is from the study of Joshi. 20, this is very recent, 2021. And of course, adipose human stem cells will mitigate thermal hyperalgesia. It upregulates interleukin 10. These are the good interleukins or cytokines, but it downregulates interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 6. So very helpful. So the growth factors that we mentioned coming from the stem cells are important in regulating nerve regeneration. What about PRP? Now, PRP, uh, this is a study uh, of uh, the group of Hassanian where they use PRP for diabetic neuropathic pain. So could it make a difference? So among 60 adult patients, they were treated uh, this for six months and assessed at one, three, and six months, divided into two groups. One group was treated with perineural injection. The, the other group was just treated medically. And of course, it shows in this study that PRP is an effective treatment for diabetic neuropathic pain and has shown to significantly alleviate neuropathic pain and numbness symptoms. So nerve conduction studies have, have uh, proven that to be, to be the case. And of course, uh, the more recent ones, and for those of you who are doing this, alpha-2 macroglobulin for peripheral nerve lesions is a study by Jordan Sheldon, and they injected uh, in a condition affecting the neurogenic thoracic outlet area. And there's, this is a retrospective study uh, trying to find out what the A2M will do. And so there are 62 patients 
46 uh, female and 16 male, and the age is just so big, 25 to 27. They're, they, are, they are diagnosed with different cases, CRPS, thoracic outlet, and of course, MTP pain, and they were evaluated one, three, and six months using a brief pain inventory. And of course, the results shows that 61% of thoracic outlet syndrome achieve a clinical endpoint at three months. So three months, results are good. 35% of CRPS improve and 24% with MTP pain also improve. And of course, further, they also monitor that up to the six month period in an additional 30% of patients achieve further improvement for the TUS group, 13% for CRPS group, and of course, 18% for MTP group. So the conclusion was A2M is more effective for thoracic outlet syndrome done on CRPS. So what is an A2M? So this is a study uh, by Aran Gilovic. Of course, and of course I made also on my own uh, a write up about A2M. It's a plasma protease inhibitor, a cytokine carrier, and of course a ligand for cell signaling. And it has the ability to bind TNF and interleukin beta and inhibits in the toxin toxicity. It also inhibits interleukin-6 and interleukin-18. So those are the bad cytokines that causes pain in neuropathic conditions. And it alleviates neuropathic pain and reduces cartilage loss for severe degenerative conditions. Well, initially, the ATM actually was used for, for uh, severe degenerative joint conditions. But lately, we were using it for uh, neuropathic pain and nerve problems. That's why if you go through the readings, you will find out that a lot of, uh, of the severe case of arthritis responds well with A2M. So this one is actually uh, an example of, uh, again, of higher dissecting using A2M on the uh, common peroneal nerve. A patient is uh, complaining of pain over the leg and towards also the, the uh, lateral portion of the knee. And then I did uh, a hydrodissection of the common peroneal nerve and uh, just two sessions and uh, the pain was relieved to more than 50%. So I'm happy enough with the results with, with that uh, uh, patient. Now other uses is the A2M for chronic pelvic pain. This is a, a study also by Broca Brooks and then they injected into the Alcox canal maybe at the pedendal nerve using hydrodissection technique for chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And of course, they also have found good results in this study using A2M. So other effects of A2M, as we have mentioned earlier, it has uh, the ability to uh, oppose the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 1 beta, 6, 10 F alpha, and it is also a protease inhibitor for those suffering from degenerative joint diseases. And of course, as you can see in, a, in the knee here, where there is a pro-inflammatory cytokines, the A2M also is used uh, to trap all these cytokines here. So as you can see here, this is a joint. So initially that was the purpose of A2M. But as you can see, the same mediators that you found in the joint is also found in the nerves. And that is the reason why it is also equally effective for nerve conditions. Now, this is a, a 58 year old lady complaining of severe dorsal foot pain diagnosed as deep peroneal nerve impingement. So I did an injection of deep peroneal nerve, just one session because of the severe pain. He has been suffering for this for uh, more than three months already. And uh, because of the pandemic, he was not able to come and visit but then uh, eventually one of those days that he is available and that also I opened my clinic, then I did an A2M for the deep peroneal nerve. And that uh, two days after the treatment, the pain goes down to about only three over 10 from 10 over 10. And this is another example of a patient suffering from low back pain. He's a 33 year old lady. And as you can see, there are fasciculations that I've noticed at the media. So if you look at this video right here, you will notice that there is fasciculations at the inner portion of the inner thigh. So what I did 
initially was to do a hydro dissection of the saphenous nerve. And then I also did a hydro dissection common irony. Then after a week, because the lady is a doctor, I asked her about the result of the treatment. And he told me that the, the fasciculation has, uh, has gone. And of course, the nerve pain is down to four over 10, from 10 over 10. He could hardly walk. He could hardly negotiate to the comfort room. Very has a very difficult time trying to do that. But after the treatment, he has improved a lot. So if you, if you will notice here, uh, this is a very helpful uh, treatment that we can consider as part of the durative interventions. So first of all, it is important to distinguish between a nociceptive and neuropathic. So what is a nociceptive? It's just a pain affecting the, the soft tissue, neuropathic pain affecting the somatosensory area. And of course, a basic knowledge of the dynamics and pathophysiology of neuropathic pain, and of course, uh, are very helpful to be able to diagnose that. And of course, uh, present medical intervention only provide less than 50% pain relief. And neuropathic pain exists in 20%, 25% of chronic pain. Then of course, diagnosis of neuropathic pain takes an average of one year. And then additional one year is needed for pain center referral. So it's a long time. So don't be surprised if you accept late patients. Pro-inflammatory cytokines exist in both degenerative joint and peripheral nerve in injuries. So those are the interleukin 1, 6, and GNF alpha. They are both found in both joint and peripheral nerve injuries. And of course, there are various regenerative therapies that we can use. And of course, there are still positive studies at present, but uh, you can try some of them yourself. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure uh, you enjoy the lecture and I hope uh, you be safe wherever you are. And God bless you all. Thank you.